Exactly. So here's what's powerful, what's so interesting about this. I actually know the guy who was the pastor of this congregation in the 1970s. And the big challenge of his day is he had to be the guy who closed their evening service. Oh. Why? Because it was disrupted by 60 minutes. <laughs> when 60 minutes started, took over the Sunday night time slot, 50 years ago, if you're paying attention to 60 minutes, it started without a big of an audience, but by the middle of the 1970s, it was not only the leading show on television, it changed television behavior. So Sunday night became, for many places in the country, TV night, television night, or family night at home. And it disrupted evening services in the mainline denominations. So he had to be the guy who closed the evening service. It was closed in the 1970s, and that is still there. And the other part about this church, I know the pastor who's there today, they have, they don't, they do have a church service on Sunday morning. They got a couple of them, but what they also have is three other services in three other languages on three other days of the week. A hundred years ago, they couldn't even imagine that you would need to be able to, to publish um, the different days of the week, the different times, and the different languages that would worship in this congregation. So the question I want you thinking about as you're thinking about change is what are they going to laugh at you about 100 years from now? <laughs> what is the thing that we can, are convinced should never change, that we would etch in stone, that we today would look at and think that they are exactly the wrong thing? I mean, I look at them trying to figure out why they didn't put like the, you know, the Westminster Catechism in stone or the Ten Commandments or, or, the, or the Great Commission. I would have been much better if that had been over the door than this. But this is what they chose to etch in stone. The, dis, the, ch the fundamental task of leadership is distinguishing between what needs to be preserved and what needs to change. Now, let's be really clear about this. Change is hard. Alan Dushman wrote a book called Change or Die. And what he did is he studied people who were told by their doctors they need to change or die. These are people who were told, you know, they have that moment, right, where the doctor says, hey, why don't you uh, slip your clothes back on and come back in my office, let's talk for a minute. And they sat down in the chair, and the doctor went on the other side of the desk and opened up their ch chart, looked him in the eye, and had to tell them as clearly as possible, if you walk out of here and you don't change your behavior, you're going to die. If you have one more cigarette, one more drink, one more drug, eat one more twinkie, you're going to die. <laughs> and what Deutschman figured out is that if you could get people's attention, if you could sit them down and get their focus and create the urgency of that kind of delivery, if you can give them the facts and show them the chart and let them know this is how serious it is, if you can give them a choice at that moment, then only 90% of them will die. It means that for most of us, change is scarier than dying. And if that's true for us as individuals, imagine what that's like for our congregations, our organizations, our denominations. Now what Deutschman did is he did a very interesting thing with his study. He decided basically to do what's called a positive deviant study. He studied the 10% that did change. Instead of setting all the excuses, he decided to figure out, well, what works? And here's what we found out. Now, I want you to know this is the most depressing part of the whole day. The next five minutes are really bad. Because here's what doesn't produce change, and I call them, these are a few of my favorite things. Um, what doesn't produce change are fear, facts, and force. You cannot scare people into change. You can try as hard as you will, but it, it will not change. I experienced this firsthand as a pastor. I served at, at a pastor two and a half miles from Camp Pendleton Marine Base, two and a half miles from the San Ano Free Nuclear Generating Station, and on 9-11, 2001, when those planes went into the Twin Towers into the Pentagon, I experienced an entire congregation that knew exactly that we were going on. <laughs> that we were immediately on alert. I was told I've got to get there, get the kids out of the preschool, and get them home, because we are we were told that we are two and a half miles from at least one of the next expected targets. The list of targets included the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station. And we had to prepare for that reality. And I watched what happened in our congregation in 2001 before there was Twitter or Facebook or social media, and most people just had dumb phones, not smartphones. 
I don't care. You can tell a few people that we're going to pray that night, and the chat and the sanctuary was packed. And some of you will remember this from your own churches, right? That night, and for the next weeks after, because of what had happened, people were driven to their knees, and people were coming, were talking about the fact that this could be the beginning of a revival. And for the next three months, we saw church attendance spike around the country. But on September 11, 2002, one year later, George Barner reported that church attendance in the United States was lower than it had ever been in its history. When you scare people, they revert back. Fear makes people respond against the fear more than they're willing to change. You see this over and over and over again. Little kids who were told, I'm out of the age where we had film strips that tried to get us to all brush our teeth with chloride toothpaste, right? You had a little, you had a little cassette player, and you had a film strip, and you'd play this out, and you'd go, beep, and you'd put the film to the next picture, beep, and you show pictures of children with their teeth rotting out. You do not want to be like these children. Go home and brush your teeth. If you don't brush your teeth, you're going to end up with your teeth rotting out like these children. And they show the pictures of the kids with their teeth rotten out, and they look, you don't, you don't want to smile like that, do you? No! And what they found is when you scared kids, they go home and brush the heck out of their teeth for two days. <laughs> <laughs> and then it gets worse. They brush their teeth less. Fear creates a reaction. Fear starts and brings, makes people rally and get excited and change, and then it creates a reaction, and people get more insulated from actually changing. Fear doesn't create change. Facts don't create change either. You can open the chart, you can show them the blood word, you can be like in my denomination where every single year we publish how many people that we have lost or grown in the last year, and for over 40 years we have been on a consecutive streak of losing every single year. We've lost over half our membership in the last generation. We publish it every single year, and every year someone says, maybe we'll take seriously the facts that are in front of us. Somebody predicted that when the last Presbyterian is going to turn out the last light in the last church, and it's sometime in the next 25 years. And every year you say, we'll show them the facts, we'll deal with the brutal facts, and the facts will bring change. And every year we go, hmm, okay. Now we publish stuff like, hey, we didn't lose as many people as last year. Hey. <laughs> Facts don't ever change. You know this too, right? How many of you know? Just, I, mean, I mean, we all struggle and get older, you know? Like, if you want to lose a few pounds, you got to eat less and exercise more. There's your facts. There's nothing else. Write that down. You got one fact from the day. And how many of us, do, I mean, knowing that fact will it change the way in which we eat or what we do with our day? Facts don't change. Third thing is force doesn't change. This is for all the associate pastors in the room or the, or the, you know, the board people that think, this is like I say, every millennial, so like this is where they're all disappointed because they keep thinking, man, all we need is for the last baby boomer to die. When we're in charge, <laughs> once our generation takes over, then things are going to change, brother. Because once we have the power, once we have the authority, then it will change. All we need is a change to the guard. Now the force doesn't change people either. People immediately will be, they become like they were before. Systems are stronger than that. Fear, facts, and force don't bring change. I told you this is the most depressing part of the whole day right here. Some of you are thinking, this is all I know how to do. These are my, these are my strategies for bringing change, right? So, that, so Dushman says this doesn't produce change. Okay, what does produce change? And this is what Alan Dushman found. Relate, repeat, reframe, radical. Relate. Repeat, reframe. What does it mean? What brings change? Relate. New relationships, new communities. When you get a circle of people around you in a deeper relationship with you, you begin to change because of your relationships. Relationships bring change. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous uh, often has said that about half the people sitting in a meeting, in an A meeting, are still drinking. They're still, they're not living out sobriety. The most significant difference is to keep you coming back to meetings until you finally feel comfortable enough to get a sponsor. Once you are at the place where you're willing to ask someone to step into that with you, into your recovery with you, and have a relationship, the relationships will change you. Relationships bring change. Repeat practices, new practices. You, what we do with our bodies changes our minds more than what we do with our minds changes what we do with our bodies. 
What we do with our, our actions, our practices, our disciplines change our beliefs more than our beliefs change our practices. We are going to have embodied cognition. So when we start to live out our faith, we begin to believe the faith more deeply. When you begin to share the faith, you begin to, to trust the faith. And when you live out a new set of practices for a changing world, you will find that you begin to change in the, because of those new practices. And so the new communities, the new practices, lead to reframing a new way of thinking, that new perception, that spirit of adventure, the new serendipity. And it has to be radical. By radical, what I mean is this. You can't tweak your way to genuine lasting change. You have to make a decision that goes to the root of the issue, and you have to decide to go after the root cause. Root, radical, to the root. It doesn't mean reckless, it doesn't mean ruthless, it doesn't mean random, it just means it has to be radical, it has to be rooted in genuine change. Relate, repeat, refrain. New communities, right? A core of discovery, new practices. We're not gonna canoe anymore, we're gonna find horses. New reframe. We're no longer about finding a, a water route. We're about discovering a whole new world, radically. We're going to drop our canoes. We're going to start collaborating, and collaborating with, with the native tribe of people who are going to, we're going to need their help, and we're going to find our way forward. So here's a great example from the core of discovery. A huge reframe, as I said, was from saying we're about discovering a water route to we're about discovering a whole new world. Mary Weather Lewis at that moment, what happened to him, the reason why he was able to keep going, is that he went back to his core <coughs> values. He was a man of the enlightenment. You can say literally that Thomas Jefferson discipled him or trained him how to be a person who believed in enlightenment values. And enlightenment values are about two things. They're about furthering the happiness of the human race through growing in knowledge. So the enlightenment was about people will be more happy, successful, fulfilled as we grow in knowledge, particularly scientific knowledge of the world around us. And so you, you can see that Mary Wood Lewis, he literally lived in the White House. He was trained by Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, he was Thomas Jefferson's protege. Thomas Jefferson was the patron saint of the enlightenment of the day. And so what he was trying to do is live out those values. And so even though they had an economic reason that was good for the country's economic fortunes, the deeper issue, the one below the surface, was about learning and discovery. So Meriwether Lewis, on his 31st birthday, in the middle of the core of discovery, while he is out there, you know, he's given up the White House, he's given up his comfortable bed, he's leading this grand ex expedition, this great exploration, he writes on his birthday, I reflected that I had yet done but little, very little indeed, to further the happiness of the human race or to advance the information of the succeeding generation. In other words, even in the middle of this, I realized I've done very little to live out my core values. So on my 31st birthday, resolved in the future to live for mankind as I have heretofore lived for myself. What happens when you get to the Lemhi Pass? What happens when you realize you're stepping into uncharted territory? How do you discern the difference between what do you preserve and what do you change? How do you change? You change by joining with a new community of people, a new group, a new team, a new set of relationships who are willing to take to step into a new way of being, a new embodied set of practices that give them a reframe that takes them back to their deepest core values, back to the root of what they believe. The way, one of the ways that I understand how this process works, this process of how do you lead people appropriately, and how do you lead people, how do you reframe the challenge in front of us comes from this work by Ronald Heifetz and Marty Linsky at Harvard. And it's basically um, it's rooted in their book called Leadership on the Line. And what it talks about is by looking at a problem and distinguishing in the problem whether it is a technical problem or an adaptive challenge. 
This is a grid for thinking about your problems. So I'm going to ask you to think about your church and think about the kinds of challenges you're facing. Technical problems are problems that an expert can solve. It's not a trivial problem. It's not a technology problem. A technical problem is a problem that an expert can solve. So a technical problem can be a really big, important problem, right? Um, uh, open heart surgery is a technical problem. There are experts who know how to do that and can do that. Adaptive challenges are challenges that there is not an expert who can solve it. You don't have expertise. An adaptive challenge requires you to make a shift in your attitudes, behaviors, or values. It requires you to adapt from your core values toward this moment without losing them. An adaptive challenge is that which requires <coughs> learning and loss. And an adaptive challenge makes you deal with a gap in your behavior or values. It makes you deal with the competing values between what you say you believe and what you're actually doing. Or what you say you're committed to and what you actually are, how you're actually behaving. So let me be really clear about this. Technical challenges, technical problems uh, are important. The work you do when you are called to the bedside of someone who is dying, and you usher them into the hand of Jesus is a technical challenge that requires every bit of your expertise, wisdom, care, and spirituality. And it's why people call us as pastors. The work you do to help children you know, be able to get to uh, resources within the community, to help people um, face issues of poverty, or to tutor kids in school, or the things we do that are deeply important, the, the handling of biblical texts, the, handling of tradition, the preaching of sermons, those are technical challenges, technical problems, and they're really important, right? So uh, open heart surgery, technical challenge. It can be done by an expert. Matter of fact, if you're going to have an open heart surgery, you want it done by an expert. <laughs> Adaptive challenges are challenges where people are going to be learning as they go. So when I fly home tomorrow, I don't want an adaptive pilot, right? I want someone who's done that route all the time and knows how to handle whatever weather is coming, right? I don't want an adaptive dentist, right? I, I, I want technical solutions. But the struggle for most of us is that what we try to do is, is address adaptive challenges with old technical solutions, right? So this is what worked we say. This is what once worked, we say. Let's do that, we say. Oh, the church down the street that's growing is doing this, we say. Let's be like that. And what an adaptive solution says is it says, here's who we are, here's our core values, here's what matters to us, and we have to be committed to the learning and the loss of being able to adapt to our situation. My coach, Jim Osterhaus, who actually lives here in Virginia, for three years, he was my executive coach, and he taught me a bunch about this. And he wrote, adaptive leadership for the pastor involves creating an environment in which the congregation can wrestle with the competing values and implications associated with the problem. You know you're dealing with an adaptive challenge when you have clear competing values. Are we going to care for the, our, our beloved congregants who have made this church amazing? who've sacrificed their time and their energy and their money, who've served here forever, who simply want a worship service that speaks to their soul and enriches them? Or are we going to change for the person outside of here who's not interested in coming to our services, who, for the loss, for the sake of the gospel, are we going to be focused and make our priority for the unchurched or for the church? Those are competing values. They're all both deeply important, right? The notion we have to grapple with is that adaptive challenge, and there's no quick fix, there's no technical solution that's going to take us through. You're going to have to work yourself through the issue. Okay, so here's what I want you to do for a few minutes. I'm going to give you another 10 minutes to back at your table. What I'd like you to do is think about your particular church, church or your organization. Think about where you find yourself. Try to nail one, just ask, what is one challenge that your church or your organization, your group, 
just can't get traction on? What is one thing that just keeps coming back over and over and over again? No matter how hard you work on it, you find yourself talking about it again. And I want you to try to identify that and talk about that and try to have that firmly in your mind as we go through the rest of our time. So let me just give you a few minutes around the table